Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 492. That's 492 of the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to hear. How am I? You know, doing the best I can with the time I have available presently. If it's your first time tuning into the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, a five-star review, only take you five minutes to do, probably even less than five minutes, will definitely help the show to go a long way. So make sure you do that for me. It'll help it climb up the charts. We'll get it on the algorithms and all that good stuff. So just spare me five minutes. Chuck a quick review on, you know, on um, the Apple Place or Apple Podcast Store, sorry. And then, you know, that will do me a massive favor. It doesn't have to be much. You can just put stars on there. Two, three, one, five. I don't give a crap. Write a little short review and help the boy out. And of course, support via Patreon is also more than welcome. At patreon.com, for just Agostino, you get bonus content on there. I've currently got my review of the last time that I went out, which, if I'm not mistaken, was the Labyrinth Sessions All Day Affair with Gerd Jensen. So if you want to know some of my feelings about that then definitely go and tune into the patreon i've got some more stuff coming for you there as well but make sure you tune in there's only one pound equivalent of one dollar per month don't delay don't skank back your boy today at patreon.com for just agostino you find the dls and the links in my description but yeah man well one for the guan how are you guys doing how is life how are you feeling I'm feeling mighty fine, as you can tell. I'm not feeling the best in terms of uh, coolness, unfortunately, for some random reason. At the beginning of September, the UK decided to get really humid, and now I've kind of had to don this um, vest decor that I'm wearing that kind of makes you look a little bit rough around the edges, but also makes you look like some sort of, you know, trap R&B singer type style kind of guy in it. So it's a bit of a mad one, but, you know, you have to make do with it for the moment. Um, I'm kind of liking it because my collarbones are starting to show because of all the weight I've been losing over the last couple of weeks and shit, you know what I mean? So I just want to show off some of the gains a little bit. So please allow me, indulge me for one second. I beg of you. I apologize for some of this vanity and shallowness that's coming through this podcast. But sometimes when you feel yourself, you got to acknowledge it. You got to acknowledge it. Um, but yeah, apart from the humidity and all that, what have I been doing? I've been recovering from back to back braves and going out and not even that much, you know, getting on it like Sonic and stuff, just mostly just being out and about in places having your feet stomping on the ground dancing and shaking your hips it does take its hold on you somewhat and in between now i think i had a couple of burgers maybe a couple of burgers too many at a particular drink that i'm going to talk about later that kind of led me to this place where i'm at now where i'm kind of like Bleh. but you know a couple of spells are running a couple of spells are working now i'll get back to where i need to be but as i mentioned a few times on this show in the past as well i love mondays so mondays are a good time to reset i'm currently recording this at like 12 midnight or something so it's just gone past monday but still I love to start the week I love to reset I love to kind of turn a new leaf and then hopefully use that as a jumping off point for the stuff I'm going to do the weekend or just kind of follow through again for another week because I think I'm due to go what's the big thing I'm doing oh yeah I'm going to um the labyrinth open air thing in Toft Manor in it so see uh Dixon Arm and um hopefully DJ Holographic so that should be awesome so there's really no need to kind of get ramped up for this weekend probably just lay low do the gym thing you know drink loads of green juices and then hit hard again on the 18th that's what you got to do nowadays man honestly covid took every bit of momentum and endurance i built up before then out of me now i've kind of had to start from zero um to build that endurance back up again i don't think i'm ever going to get back to where i was prior like i said to somebody the other day um prior to covid it was 2019 i was djing in local pars, bars and pubs where i live for the best part of what a year solid i was playing basically Thursday to Saturday for the most part sometimes mostly Friday to Saturday um then I was working nine to five then I was going out afterwards so that would mean I'd be work at work nine to five I'd have to bring my stuff with me go and play until 1 a.m I might start at nine I'd probably start at 10 play until one and then go out somewhere else from one until like seven do you know what I mean and then rinse and repeat on the Saturday and then sleep in on the Sunday and then back to work on a Monday I don't think I'm gonna get back to that again because it just that, that that kind of momentum you only really build up when you're in it and at the moment now you know 
the bar and pub gigs at the moment are kind of drying up um, for for probably quite legit reasons. Maybe it's partly down to my, you know, in a, inactivity in playing has kind of led to my levels maybe dropping somewhat. Maybe it's also led to mostly to the fact that bars and pubs in my area just aren't as full as they once was. So they can't really justify having a proper person coming in and play. I mean, it just doesn't probably make any more any sense really. So I completely get that. You might as well just save your money and hire a couple more bar backs. You know what I mean? Then getting someone to play. Yeah, you might as well hire a couple more bar backs and, and get someone to put on a decent Spotify playlist and really there's no difference no one really cares if I'm there don't get me wrong it's, it's an added bonus if I'm able to play some tunes that they like and stuff and make them dance especially when I get into my bashment hour but for the most part these men don't give a shite but yeah um, so that's been about it so um, yeah it's, it's been a bit of a wake up call in that regard but I, I don't mind it to be fair I think things need to evolve it's unlikely you're going to stay the same all the way throughout your entire life there's going to be ebbs and flows and if I was ever going to take this stuff up professionally I'd have to make that change anyway I mean you can't work in this industry or be a professional in it and also go ham in the pain i just don't think it marries up well especially if you're, it depends if you want to do good work if you want to be at the top of your game and you want to be well regarded amongst your peers and you want to make work that's kind of impactful your fans resonate with and they want to come and see you again and again you're going to have to sack off the going out and the getting on it you're just going to have to it's going to have you have to decide between the art and the lifestyle you're going to have to decide it's just one or the other obviously when the big when you big, when you start off one feeds into the other i know for me there'll be times where i'll be out djing and where and again maybe it's a you got like a warped sense of self but i remember those place times where i'd be going i'd be djing in warehouse parties and hackney wick and stuff and stuff like off my face do you know what i mean and i did pretty decent but nowadays i couldn't do that and i wouldn't want to do that because i'll you know most likely the person inviting me is a friend most likely if they're not paying me they're maybe covering my uber or they're giving me a crate of beers and i feel obliged to do a good job if they've i mean it doesn't matter what they're doing just the fact that your friends are asking you for a favor you don't want to come in there like sloshed off your face so there's that kind of you know responsibility that you have um in order to kind of you know do right by your guy or your girl and then also the people in front of you dancing you don't want them to give them a shitty show do you know what i mean so and you never know who's watching you never know who that person might be so there is a real reckoning that's coming to pass so that's probably one of the unintended consequences of this lockdown and COVID. It's made me realise that maybe my uh, levels that I was at previously are not sustainable and probably not long lasting. <laughs> what a trip, mate. What a trip. But yeah, anyway, loads of stuff to get into. Um, grab yourself a drink. I got myself a little glass of water here in a little whiskey glass as you can see that is a ultimate sign of a monday um so yeah grab yourself a drink and nibble and we're gonna dive on deep loads of topics to talk about loads of things to get through i don't want to waste any more of your precious time so the first thing i did this weekend or i did this week prior yeah what well, i did this past weekend so i'm not talking about the first thing i did this past weekend was i visited the legendary or just legendary the legendary um horn the legendary old school uk horn known as wendy's um I, I've, I've visited obviously you know the, the one of the newly launched stores that opened in Stratford East London um, and how do we start this so I have high expectations for it right only because of the reviews I think everyone else would have told me sensibly that if I would have read the menu checked over the prices and heard you know kind of read into Wendy's backstory I would have not been su surprised at the level of food that I was served right but the reviews on YouTube especially for the branch they open in Reading maybe because they've had a lot more time to you know iron out the kinks but some of the reviews for that restaurant in Reading the wet the red Reading sorry the Reading version of Wendy's were just making it seem like it was one of the best burger joints ever right and considering that the uk in general has probably some of the best burger restaurants you would ever touch base at there's one particular one i was remembering in brighton i forgot the name of it it's got like a green sign i think it's two dudes that run it really nice guys um I'm going to say one's black and one is like Middle Eastern. I'm not too sure. But if you know what I mean, you know what I mean. And then not even including the ones in London, right? That are just, you know, meat liquors, obviously one of the OGs. Even Honest Burgers do a pretty decent burger in there. Um, everyone's got a decent burger, right? For the most part. Burgers are really, you know, the, there's just too many options to choose from. And obviously two of the biggest or the best options to choose from in London in terms of walking in and getting a real good burger is Shake Shack and Five Guys for various reasons, right? But I always prefer my own opinion. I think Five guys is just above shake shack just because of how you know it's all just kind of succulently sort of um you know wrapped into itself and the meat is just oozing out and the bun is just right like you know obviously you can garnish it how you want so if i was going to go for a straight cheeseburger i'll definitely say five guys over 
Shake Shack, but still, they're one and the same. They probably, you know, share number one spot. So when I'm listening to people on YouTube say that well, this Wendy's that they went to in Reading was the best burger they've ever had, some even said it was better than Shake Shack or oh, Five Guys. I was like, wow, this is gonna be lit, innit? If, if this is opening up in Stratford, a place that I can easily go and visit, it's not Reading, of course, then this is gonna be amazing. It's gonna be a definitely good spot to go to if you wanna do a little cheat day or whatever it may be. So I decided to go on Saturday and Obviously, because it's been the opening couple of weeks, there's still queues outside. Um, I think the Wendy spot, if I'm not mistaken, outside the Stratford Shopping Mall is the is the former spot where the Pizza Hut used to be. So if you're familiar with Stratford, you know where that is. So it's a fairly big space. Um, the main floor is basically where you go and order your food. And then upstairs is where all the seating area is. Um, the food ordering process is a bit strange. When you walk in or as you make it past the bouncer, it makes you look like a club as you're queuing up to go inside to buy some cheap burgers. There's like a there's like usually a girl like you know in on a tiny little desk sort of thing taking one bit of order and then you go to the other back the back bit there's like a standard kind of ordering place with like the menu uh on the wall on screens and shit and then you order you get your receipt and then you wait and then basically you get called your number or the number shows up on a screen with another hole where they kind of serve out the food and they put it on the trays these little metal trays that you kind of take with you to go upstairs and then that's just as bad as you go back to go upstairs there's like a little area for condiments for you to get napkins I'm not sure if that, I think there's probably a drink station there too. I don't remember. Probably think there is. And then upstairs, of course, there's another drink machine too with all the kind of fizzy pops and whatnot you can have to for, at your heart's content. So fairly decent layout, easy to kind of get around. First thing, good thing about it is the price. The price is insane. I got two burgers. I got like a Baconator, a classic cheeseburger or cheeseburger deluxe, I think, um, fries and a chocolate shake, medium for like just under 10 pounds or no just over 10 pounds maybe like 10 pound 23 or something like that right insanely good prices so that's one thing that i could definitely um put in his favor but in terms of the quality of food it was pretty mediocre i'm not going to say i'm i, I went as far as saying at the time i was eating it because i was really angry that someone told me this was better than five guys and it was in my opinion at the time eating it i'd said it was no better than a, a decent burger at a hotel like you know when if you go to a different country and you don't really know well you know, if you're going like on a, on a work trip, it's a better example. You're going to a work trip. You haven't really, you know, have time to prepare if you're going to sightsee because there's no time because you're on work and you're busy and you just land and then you try and go out, but you don't know where to go. And then you realize that the hotel has a pretty decent restaurant in there. So you're like, you know, what? let's just order in and let's just eat at the restaurant here at the hotel. And you end up ordering a burger because you don't want to order anything else because you're afraid it might be shit. And then you get the burger and it's like, oh, this is pretty decent, right? And because you're on a holiday, you would do some work colleagues, you might have the company card, you get a couple of cheeky beers in. Yeah, you, the, the burger experience is, you know, the experience is heightened somewhat. And I think that's what I felt with the Wendy's. It's the same, it was that, that sort of thing. It was like a kind of a decent hotel burger that you only thought was decent because you were on holiday, <laughs> Jeremy, or quote unquote, you was away from the, you was outside the country. Um, but in terms of just compared to other burgers, just even compared to McDonald's just down the road, I don't think anyone could say that that burger was any i don't it far exceed what mcdonald's would give you fair enough you'd have to choose a particular one maybe you just to go for a double cheeseburger classic or a cheeseburger or maybe a double pound uh, a quarter pounder for instance but i don't think there's much separating and if i'm completely honest the meat as well mostly inside that wendy's burger was pretty unseasoned and that might have been due partly because of it's just recently open and they haven't ironed out the kinks like i mentioned the reading store was getting rave reviews online i can't believe that the reading five guys and shake shack is that much different than what we have here in the uk sorry what we have here in london so uh, for sure i don't think these guys were gassing these guys and girls but there's a particular youtuber uh, um these couple of fat guys right white guys who i trusted because they're fat and in general who legitimately were saying that it was better than five guys one dude even ordered like 40 quid's worth of burgers which i don't know how much he must have ordered like 17 because if i was able to get two burgers fries and a shake for 20 for 10 pounds imagine what 40 quid is gonna get you do you know what i mean so he must have ordered like legitimately like half of the menu maybe more but maybe the range of the menu is pretty decent there's a salads there there's good sides there's nuggets and stuff cool right but when it comes to straight burger it's not the best in my opinion um i think it's fairly mediocre if anything i think the one thing that kind of stands out that i had was obviously the milkshake it was refreshing to have like an actual milkshake from a fast food place and not that weird 
you know, sludge that you get from McDonald's or other kind of crappy stuff. It's just, it just tastes like a milkshake. Do you know what I mean? That was fairly nice. The only thing, it does kind of melt really quickly. So you have to kind of get in there as fast as you can if you're going to dip your chips in there like a weirdo. Um, but yeah, man, I was fairly disappointed. I'm not going to lie. It was a bit of a letdown. Um, maybe again, I, I'd go back in a month or so once they iron out the kinks, but I wasn't really a big fan of it. Um, and here's a review courtesy of My London, or somebody else that went to the same Wendy's that I went to. It says, I went to London's first Wendy's. And the iconic square burgers are better than McDonald's. I disagree. I don't think they're better. I think they're maybe, maybe marginally better, but still, you know, McDonald's are still what I'd guess cheaper than to go to Wendy's in general. And they're far, they're like far, far, they're, they're way more long in their kind of production and, you know, quality of product lane than Wendy's would be. I don't know. I just didn't think the burger seasoning was that great, but maybe I'm in the minority. It says, the review i have to admit when i first heard that there was another fast food chain opening in london i was apprehensive did we really need another contender to like some mcdonald's and burger king um Mandy's has opened up its second current uk restaurant in stratford following the launch of its first venue in reading back in june i went in as a full-on wendy's novice i hadn't seen the restaurant look like and the type of food that they served or what they were known for this person was worried that we had too many fast food restaurants in london this is going to be a terrible review, I've got a feeling, but let's continue. Um, what was it about Wendy's that was going to make it stand out for me for the rest of the food chains we already have all over the country? Um, does Wendy's really have what it takes to tussle? But it's, come on, keep repeating yourself. Um, I generally didn't know what to expect. Yeah, so that's the top floor where you go and sit down with the drinks machine there and some condiments area there. So I generally didn't know what to expect from Wendy's and that's part of the appeal. Going in, I completely in the dark. In this case, probably worked in my favour. I had never seen one of the, or not, not one in the US, nor had I ever seen on TV. I don't even heard the name, so it's literally all I had to go on. Tucked away just outside the Shaffer Center windows has a sandwich um, between a KFC and a kebab shop. That's a shake, obviously, that she's holding it in her hand. It says, although the restaurant wasn't strictly open to public yet, there was a few people asking if it was open for business, which I suppose is a good sign. Um, we were shown an extra large seating area in the restaurant upstairs, Stratford being the two first floor, being the first two floor restaurant they have in the UK. The place was clean and pristine, most likely due to the fact that the customers hadn't stepped in foot. Yeah, okay, get a review of the thing. This is so unwinded long-winded wendy has touchscreen drink machine and a plethora of choices you can mix and match anything you ever wanted i was baffled by the machine i felt like i'd taken a step into the future there's obviously ordering of the food there with 15 separate items on the menu you might be thinking this is a limited choice but i actually felt like it was a perfect size the menu wasn't over complicated and sometimes that's all you want because all you crack because if you can crack your menu down to a t it doesn't matter about having endless menu. Tony Bell, Wendy Senior International Marketing Director, gave us a brief rundown about the restaurant, which evidently helped build my knowledge. Okay, let's continue. We don't care about the knowledge. Um, one thing that Tony made sure that we knew about Wendy's was that to make them stand out from the bunch is that their burger patties are square. A square burger, who do we know such a thing or Wendy's does it? Yeah, the square burger the novelty wears off as you're eating it because you want to actually taste a good burger. Their kind of burger now only marks them from the fast food chain, but also from the catchy slogan, we don't just cut corners literally, figuratively. Okay, let's get, what's your think of the food? Okay, that's right. Um, what you say about the food here? Yes, that's right. Wendy served chili. I couldn't believe it. Now I come to the fun part. It's time to tuck in. After all those things, she's just talking about the food now. We decided to go to selection of we decided to go for a selection of the classics and the UK exclusives: the baconator, the veggie stack loaded with cheese and bacon fries, four piece chicken nuggets, chili con carne, avocado, and bacon salad. Oh, and then before you were thinking, we forgot probably one of their most iconic products: the frosty. All right, let's go for it then. What do you get? Served in three different sizes. You enjoy either vanilla or chocolate frosty. So there was a plenty. There was a platter of nearly. Uh, so there was a there was a platter of nearly the entire item on the menu um the sampling each item it was clear that tony was true to his word the food tasted rather fresh than processed it didn't have the most freezer like taste than other chains do what took me by surprise was the chili not only did it blow my mind that the food restaurant would serve chili but also but to actually make it quality now that's an achievement you could describe the chili as a perfect meal to soak up your alcohol at the end of a boozy night or the ideal hangover food the other two items i was overjoyed with were the veggie stacked honestly it's so it's not nice to see, not to see a veggie burger made entirely of from potato and the salad and you can't compare the salad to get wendy's the side salad you get a local high street food chain um, when these sides are big and chunky, bloody but anyway, this this, this review is a bit of gobbledygook. When you when you get given a free meal, it's hard to criticize, it, isn't it? But 
regardless, I would definitely say if anyone tells you when it is bad in five guys, they are smoking on those good crack rocks. And I want a couple. They really are smoking on crack rocks because it's not, it's not bad. It's not better than Honest Burger. It's not better than what you call it. What did I say? Meat liquor. It's not better than all these kind of established names that we know and love here in London. It's not. It doesn't compare. It really doesn't. It's up there. Don't get me wrong. It's decent. It's probably maybe better of an experience to go to than a McDonald's. But still, McDonald's, you know what you, you know what you're going to get. You know, it says outside the tent. It's, no, it does exactly what it says outside of the tin would you really want to take a gamble on a wendy's just to try it for the novelty and it ends up not tasting that great um like i said i didn't think the burger was that impressive okay it's a square cool but you know at least tastes good you know what i mean that's what i want but the, this machine if you're into your fizzy pops is quite nuts in fact you can just mix and match everything and they don't really give a shit it's really cool you know no one's going to be harassing you or shouting at you from the till like they would do in nando's but um i think overall a little bit underwhelming prices may be good good location um if they do decide to open it maybe later on in the evenings or later at night maybe it might serve as a good luck it's like, like this person said a good place for you to go get your hangover meal on the way back from the club or whatnot but I wasn't that impressed. I got to be honest. I wasn't really that impressed. But maybe I'm in the minority here. If you've been to the Wendy's in Shafford and you thought it was banging, let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions. Next on the list, what else we did? Of course, on a Sunday, um, was it Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon? Um, watched UFC. Unfortunately, um, yeah, watched the UFC and unfortunately for Darren Till at UFC Vegas 36, he was not the victor, even though he's been crying out for what well, he's been telling us, you know, many, many times that he has aspirations to be a champion. That's why he sees his long term future. He knows he's special. The quality of the fan base that he has, the fact that he's amazing on social media, has the gift of the gab on interviews. It kind of, you know, speaks to and the fact that he's got great stand up. And obviously the way he came into the UFC with that emphatic victory over Donald Cerrone you just expected him to kind of leap and bound from the back of that but obviously his division is incredibly stacked um he maybe isn't as well rounded a fighter as he should be and if you want to really go for the belt if you want to go for that strap you really do have to be well rounded in the UFC you don't you can't get away with just being a grappler you can't just get away with being an elite level striker you have to combine all elements of mixed martial arts you just have to especially again if you want to win the belt if it's if you just want to be a fairly decent you know a UFC fighter and have a decent record and just you know get consistent uh, paydays and whatnot then it probably won't matter but if you do want to be the face of the UFC you want to be the face of the UFC UK and all that good stuff you really have to be more well-rounded and unfortunately that didn't happen Derek Brunson you know basically imposed his will on Michael Bisping for the majority of that match or the majority of that fight sorry I think was it the third round that Bisping came, sorry that Bisping that Darren Tua came out really quickly um, his stand-up was pretty decent it looked like he had Brunson worried and at the moment when Brunson felt a bit worried or felt a little bit outclassed at stand up on his feet, he just switched to wrestling and then from then it was over. Do you know what I mean? Um Darren Till couldn't stuff the takedown, he couldn't reverse anything, he tried to flip um, you know, uh Derek Brunson over as he was trying to get on top of him and inadvertently that led to him being able to bring Brunson further up into his guard and then from there the the fight was over. Darren Till turns, gives Brunson his back, which you some would argue was like a sign of him basically giving up. And then Brunson, you know, basically was able to submit him with a rear naked choke. And there you go. Good night, Irene. And, you know, Darren Till left pretty quickly after the match. He hasn't really given a statement since, I don't think. So he's obviously clearly distraught. And then Bisbing had some very encouraging words for him to say in terms of him trying to be a uh, a champion. And maybe he said he can maybe move back down to welterweight. That might actually help him. But again, the weight cut on that was fairly sick. That's the thing, though, because he's in that weird weight. He's in that weird weight class. Obviously, when you watch this fight, although they're quite similar size, mm, sizes, I guess shape-wise, Brunson looked just wider. He just looked like he had more body mass. Forget the whatever yeah you know what I mean he just looked like there's a bit more substantial to him um he just looked bigger uh, but then unfortunately Bisbing I mean sorry Bisbing I keep saying Bisbing Darren Till that welterweight is just going to be too I don't say too small but it looks like the weight cuts are fucking bitch for him do you know what I mean if he was struggling this fight camp if it would something people are saying there was some sort of injury they just imagine what it's going to be like when he tries to go down to welterweight I just I don't know but anyway the article says Michael Bisbing move back down to welterweight may help Darren Till after being out muscled by Derek Brunson 
Michael Bisping still believes the potential of his countryman Darren Till to be able to overcome his recent setbacks and become the UFC champion, but he wonders if the 185 pounds is still the division that holds up brightest weight for the Liverpudlian. Oof, I remember those 185 pounds, man. I was wearing so much Comme des Garçons, Junior Watanabe on my E. That's what I was in. I was in that. I was in that moment. I can't wait to get back to that. I'm at the moment, what, I'm at 235. Um, slowly but surely going to get back to the, down to the size I need to get to, and I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Anyway, continue. Till suffered his fourth loss over his last five fights. Fourth loss over five fights. It's a bad record for somebody. That's the thing. That's why sometimes I understand why some UFC fighters can get annoyed at people like a Darren Till and feel like the UFC is an unfair fighting organization because Darren Till's lost a lot of fights for somebody so young in his career. Um, again, don't get me wrong. Some of the fights or most of the fights have been to very high level guys. It's not like he's losing to bums, but he still gets, you know, a favorable coverage on the UFC. He's all over media outlets. He's got, you know, a very, very more than decent um, social media following. People seem to love him online, but in the cage, in the octagon itself, he doesn't seem to be matching up with all the hype that's outside of it. You know I mean, that's the only thing I'd say is slightly disappointing. He said the setback put Till's record at one, one and two since he's moved up from welterweight to middleweight in 2019 and pushed Till further out of the title picture at 185. Considering that many of Till's best wins came at welterweight, including his unanimous decision over Stephen Thompson that capped a 5 and 0 start to his T2 UFC career, based on question whether Till is doing himself a disservice to by trying to compete in the higher weight class. He said he needs to make some changes. Um, I think perhaps a move back down to welterweight may help him. When you look at Derek Brunson, Compared to him, Derek Brunson is a much bigger guy. I'm not talking about the height-wise. Oh, he mentioned the same thing I mentioned. Um, he's height-wise, they're very similar. But when you look at the frame, and uh, and with the frame, with the muscle comes a lot of strength. And certainly when you're fighting guys like Brunson, uh, there was clearly the MO is to take you down. And of course, technique comes into play. But a lot of what comes into play is strength. Once you get into these clinch positions, it comes down to power. And Derek Brunson kind of out-muscled him in those situations as well. Yeah, for sure. It, there was a lot of our muscling but I still think it's just technique. Darren Till just doesn't have any, you know, decent wrestling or takedown defense, which again is interesting because he spent a large chunk of his, you know, young life in Brazil. But from what we have heard so far, it was mostly doing like Thai, Muay Thai or whatever. Yeah, Mu Muay Thai, whatever. Muay Thai Pacific, which is interesting because you know, you'd think, you know, being an, a foreign over there, he'd try his hand at a bit of jujitsu. But I guess he was just more interested in, you know, kicking bags and smashing birds and whatnot. But hey, it continues. Says Bisping is correct that Brunson dominated Till of his takedowns. The American wrestled Till to the mat in each of his three rounds of their main fight card of uh, bout before sending him home with an ending with a fight ending choke Till suffered a similar fate in the biggest spot of his career when 2018 title chance against Woodley um, he turned into the route because Woodley wrestling and top game as a British fighter also travelled in a world effort to show up his deficiencies in the defensive wrestling for his career and did so rather successfully based on questioning whether Till's training situation is preparing Liverpool native for level wrestling he's running into the highest level of the fight game he says, I'm not suggesting he leaves Tom Caburn. Sorry, but maybe go somewhere where they have a heavier influence on wrestling, certainly on jiu-jitsu as well. With the absolute respect, the ground game could have been a little better to here tonight. No shame in the takedowns. Derek Brunson is a strong wrestler. He's built his entire career on that. But I thought when it hit the ground, I thought he could have done some things a little bit better. Yeah, for sure. Definitely agree with that. So you know disappointing for Darren Till but not disappointing for Paddy Pemblet he staged a pretty impressive debut at UFC 36 um Las Vegas um very very impressive um don't get me wrong you know his chin's always in the air um he looks flipping insane when he's fighting in there he's legitimately like he's fighting in a bar somewhere you know he's just kind of hounding you down he's got that weird kind of come on let's have it kind of stance but he's he's, he's gonna be a fun watch in the, in the ufc let's not deny it. paddy's gonna be a flipping fun watch another one gift of the gab great on camera um he's probably his social media is gonna be blowing up i guess over the next coming weeks especially if he gets announced another fight between now and the end of the year like he's obviously hoping that he does um i think the ufc if they're able to give him some favorable matchups he's going to be a pretty decent cash cow for them he might be end up uh, he might end up being a pretty decent cash cow and a pretty decent person to put on fight cards that you probably 
aren't the best and you want to pepper them with maybe some fun fights and you know he's going to go out there and really kind of bring it to whoever his opponent is going to be um calling him paddy the baddie is interesting as well but i guess it doesn't have the same connotation that we i would have with the baddie but you know we continue um again very impressive um the power in his hands is very it's very much there um when he hit thing what's his name when he hit luigi you could tell he was seeing stars pretty quickly. Um, I was a big fan of that, so I'll big up him. I'm definitely hoping we see him fight more often. And then the other mention will be Tom Aspinall, who ended up getting a bonus as well for his first round victory of a is it Spinak or Spivak, who by the looks of it didn't look like he had any reason to be in the same octagon as Tom Aspinall. Tom Aspinall was really impressive. He's another one of those heavyweights that moves like a lightweight or moves like a middleweight. Like he's so agile on his feet. He's boxing or his hands are super, super fast. He's the kind of guy that I would actually love to see fight a Cyril Gunn before Cyril Gunn goes to fight maybe in a guy. But maybe it's not, it doesn't make sense in terms of the rankings. Maybe Aspinall has to fight a couple more higher up people. But I would really like to see a Cyril Gunn and Tom Aspinall fight. Like that is stylistically going to be a mindfuck because they're both heavyweights. Yeah, they're huge guys, but they move so light on their feet. It's just crazy to watch. I'd be really interested in that. I'd be very interested to see Tom Aspinall give John Jones his UFC debut at the heavyweight. That would be pretty sick, I think, in terms of a fight. Like, I think that would be good because Tom Aspinall, from what we know, is like a pretty decent... He's got pretty decent jiu-jitsu too, even though what he's shown us so far has been some blistering knockouts. Like, that knockout against Spivak was beautiful. They were like in a clinch. He went for... I think they were in a clinch or kind of pivoting around. Um, no, sorry, um, Spivak went for a takedown. Uh, Tom Aspinall stuffed the takedown. They kind of got into a clinch and then he kind of... He did a knee to the to the ribs to Spivak which he didn't really react to or move or cover his face or anything so I guess Tom Aspinall registered that and then as they spun back out into the middle of the octagon again he gave him another knee again to the rib cage the, I guess the grip had got to get loose and as the grip came loose Tom Aspinall in the clinch elbow to the side of the face and then boom Spivak was seeing stars he stumbles to the side of the cage and then Tom Aspinall kind of finished it with a ground and pound but I was like oh that was so beautiful The you know how he just quickly processed that okay knee to the ribs he doesn't he, he's not flinching or moving his hand to protect his face in case something else comes over on the other side alright boom smash in a clinch elbow that was fucking beautiful to see so that was decent decent fight card and then of course one of the other kind of standout moments was Khalil Ram Trees, um, very unorthodox um, TKO where he essentially oblique kicks or kicks um, his opponent just above the knee so his knee kind of hyper extends and buckles under it um, a lot of fighters are saying that kind of injury is a career a career ender or it can completely alter the trajectory of your career which is really disappointing um, but I guess that's just a fight game isn't it it's a limb it's an option it's a part of a body that somebody can inflict damage on in order to end the fight in their favour and I just think what are you going to do how are you going to out or something like that do you know what I mean it's a it's a pretty I think legit move um obviously for the for the person receiving it it's not the nicest I'm sure to have somebody you know kick with all the force that they have you know side kick just at the top of your knee so that your knee hyper extends or buckles it's probably not very enjoyable but if you're fighting somebody and you actually want to remove one of their options of moving around the octagon and maybe having that spring in their step or whatnot or maybe making it easy for them to or making or making them an easier target to take down definitely weakening their legs in some respects and their ability to move out of take it of the takedowns is a good option so yeah that was ufc face is it 36 ufc 36 yeah in vegas um what else did i do oh yeah then i ended up going oddly enough i ended up going to fabric of all pla of all places right fabric 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 i've had a lot of very disparaging things to say about fabric over the years um with good reason right i think if anybody has been there if anybody's from london you probably have the same love-hate relationship that i have with fabric but you know it's one of our institutions and if anything they've survived this long by um probably being maybe one of the better well-run clubs out there right they just they just do things correct there's just no hiding behind it there's no kind of if buts and maybe it's just it's the, it's the fact in it and the fact that they've got such a long history um they've been able to build and give platform to some of the biggest djs out there and over the years they've just been able to kind of reinvent themselves even against you know all kind of all, all underlying trends even when people kind of counted them out they've kind of always seemed to kind of rise up again like a phoenix so you have to give them man credit and you have to give them man credit and i think nowadays because there's just so many other venues in london and the uk you can now appreciate fabric more i think when fabric was one of the only ones around it kind of felt a bit lame 
um, you know, or whatever, you know what I mean? But now there's just so much other stuff on, different kind of bookings and programming, which is what I like. I've, I like the fact that a lot of these clubs, maybe it's because of the way the industry is and you can't book certain people if they're in the city. But I love the fact that, you you know, you're never going to get the same lineup that you're going to get in a cause as you're going to get at, at Fold, for instance. I love that, right? Even though you would assume or you'd think in your head that they both maybe got a lot of overlap in terms of their clientele, they still don't have exactly like for like venues or, you know, lineups unless the promoter's just going to move them over there. But for the most part, they both offer different sort of programming. And then again, Fabric compared to Cause and Fold is completely different too in their programming. So I'm a big fan of that. And of course, recently they did the refurb, which I covered, of course, on my podcast before, which looked fairly impressive but i was very dubious about whether that was going to do anything because again the essence of the club is rarely um in my opinion comes down to the fixtures and the lighting and this whatever it mostly comes down to the people that go there right the people that work there and the people that go there for the most part they're the ones that kind of really cultivate the atmosphere um and the feeling and the vibe of a space whether it's a shop a store an office yeah the people that work there and the people that perform they'll go there whatever are the ones that the customers and stuff are the ones that give it the vibe so I received an invite, a very, very kind invite. So big up to you know who for giving me the invite. Very, very much appreciated um, to go see mostly an Imogen Presents Wigs um, event that was happening in Fabric in Room 2. And then also to have the opportunity to go see Jeff Mills play in Room 1 for a little bit with Anastasia Christensen and Tape Feed, right? So a pretty decent and stacked lineup. Um, Focusing mostly on the wig stuff, um, pretty... decent i think approach to it um for the most part i remember seeing it featured before an ra maybe a few weeks before it got in that or maybe a few months before it actually um went down maybe around june july i'm not too sure i didn't really remember to cover it on the channel at the time but that aside um i remember signing up for a pack that you got and if i'm not mistaken the pack had like a couple of clips on there which i'm assuming related back to the idea around wigs and what they were trying to do creating this space for people or new people coming up to basically express themselves when it comes to dance flaws and other things that she's looking obviously to do um Imogen was obviously the main head behind that and then if they also included uh an EP of, of some sort if I'm not mistaken too like five tracks I don't know I haven't checked in ages but I remember it was like a five track EP all wire files so extremely high quality stuff that you can whack into a set right away all free I think there was a Matrix Man set there there was an um, um, Velt. Um, oh, sorry, Umbelt, um, Umwelt set in there too, and a few others. I'm not really too sure. I think obviously an imaging track. Maybe everyone, else, maybe everyone else featured. I'm not too sure. But uh, again, I haven't checked it in ages. And I remember that being a thing. And I just like the approach of it. I like the fact that she was sending out little email promos that were obviously written by herself, so they gave it a little bit more of a personal feel. The idea of cultivating the community. I'm talking to you. I want to build this up with you guys. I want to receive your input. And if I'm completely honest, it was a really interesting crowd. I think it made the night a lot more interesting because for the most part i'd guess the majority of people come came down there again you don't know let's not assume but let's let's say it's safe to assume most of the people that came down there came to see jeff mills and then the rest of them probably came to see a mixture of nsrj christensen take feed and again the wigs event that's happening in room two so it's a fairly even split but i guess because Jeff Mills was playing a sort of early set. What do you call it early? I don't think it was early. He played around what? What at what time did I get there? I got there around 2.30, 2.40. And I guess he was on already before I got there. So he might have been on from like 1 till 3 or something along those kind of lines. Or 1 till 3.30. And then he kind of dipped straight after. No real stays or highs or anything. He just went out. I mean, straight professional vibes out there. But... It was still a pretty good turnout for room two. I have to be honest, a really good turnout, especially again for somebody like a Jeff Mills to be in room one, who's a flipping, you know, um, colossal legend in the scene. For you to still have a fairly decent crowd in room two definitely went to show for the quality of music that was on display. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, in between that time I was in there, that um, the girl that features on here, Marie Mox, Moxtira, Moxtire, was playing, who um, got a lot of kind of good reception from the crowd that was there. Um, I've heard a couple of good things about her as well online i think i remember seeing patrick uh, mason the model creative director guy that also djs he did a night at that berlin bar called pros pro lens and bar pro pros and bar i forgot the name of it but you know what i'm talking about if you if you know the vibes which i saw featured on instagram which i'm planning to go to if i end up going to berlin hopefully by the end of this year it's a bit of an outdoor venue so i'm not too sure if there's gonna if it's gonna be open by the time i get there but if i'm not mistaken to do parties on like a thursday and a friday maybe thursday friday saturday but you know that kind of vibe is kind of like outside the uh, under a tent sort of vibe and she played there and people were really giving a lot of love i remember when it was happening on the weekend i was kind of checking and stalking people's instagram stories and stuff and everyone 
was like, yeah, she was one of the best um, warm up DJs they've seen play in a long time, and they can't wait to see her play in other places. So she got a lot of good reception from the crowd that was there. Um, I think I saw a little bit of Advent. I'm not too sure. I think I saw a little bit of Advent, and then of course I saw um, Umbel playing back to back with Imogen. Um, unfortunately, it was um, you know that Thomas was his face couldn't be there because of his. Um, very interesting views when it comes to covid and being a dj but you know let's say about that the better would have been nice to see matrix man you know i'm a big fan of his but you know maybe another time they'll probably end up doing that but i think as a debut event for fabric and the fact that fabric is known as being a bit of an old stodgy stuck in its way place for them to kind of give imogen that kind of a platform to do her own thing was fairly encouraging to see i'm not going to be i'm not going to lie um and again it's nice to see such a different crowd in there it was a weird mix of people that are obviously hardcore jeff mill fans who were just standing next to the booth um looking into one of the little fabric signs that peers into the dj booth so they can see how he mixes and stuff which is cool obviously to see but you can see those proper chin stroker dj fans there right just sitting there analyzing his mix and stuff which is mad weird but then the other room there was a lot of kind of young people um obviously you know getting into it for different reasons whatever it may be different sounds different scenes different vibes but it just kind of created a nice little atmosphere in there Do you know what I mean? you had this good little mix obviously it's still a bit of a strange mix to have like straight up like you know people that don't really know what's going on and just coming in because it's the only place open until seven and it's a fairly centrally ish location you can get home pretty easily from fabric in most places if you live in london well, i live in east and it took me only 40 minutes or like about that to get there on a night bus which is minor really to be honest listen to some tunes as i'll go on the way there so i liked it man i'm not going to lie i think i think it was really one of the better nights i stayed until about 6 30 6 45 and i had a pretty decent time bit of a dance a bit of a boogie um i wasn't on much really i was running on some water some couple of drinks and that was about it for the most part and i was absolutely knackered knackered out of my brain like absolutely like going going a little bit loopy as i was leaving the place i'm not going to lie ended up getting home at about what 8 9 a.m or something sleeping in and yeah i was i was i was very very well taken back by the entire evening um if i'm not mistaken i think when jeff was finished um i think anastasia christensen jumped on she was sick I didn't recognize that at first because I think she's got blonde hair now. So I think that was her anyway playing. I'm pretty sure it was. Um, she was really, really sick. She kept the vibes going for the entirety of the night. So much so that some guy collapsed, but he was fine. Don't get me wrong. Don't get too worried. Some guy collapsed for the sounds of her heavy beats as she's playing the ones and twos. But yeah, man, it was sick. I'm not going to lie. It was a pretty sick event, sick times. A couple of wild ads here and there, but you know what to expect when you go out in London and you're always going to bump into a few bozos. But for the most part, I thought it was a fairly enjoyable experience. The only thing that wasn't enjoyable was the entry to get into fabric. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So that's the, and then obviously a big up Imogen, one, one and again for the invite or the, the kind of extended invite from... <laughs> from your guest um very much appreciated um I had, a, I had a great time i felt very welcomed in that space um thank you so much but going back to the fabric thing um yeah the experience of going in there is not the best man i i, I kind of remember why i kind of stopped going in there um it's an interesting space isn't it because they kind of have to be heavy-handed because of all the histories they've had and you know unfortunate events have happened and transpired in that club you know with people taking drugs and overdosing or maybe not being able to handle it or whatever it's not you know vibing with them and unfortunately they pass away you know very very troubling stories for sure for the families associated with it definitely thoughts and feelings go out to those people um obviously they had to continue on the party must go on and stuff and they have to obviously make some changes to ensure that, that stuff doesn't happen again because they don't want to risk their club closing down but then of course that heavy-handed approach does lead to a fairly weird atmosphere if you are trying to go out there and do loads of drugs and drink it wouldn't necessarily be the first place i'd go to i have to be completely honest um they usually leave you alone it feels like in the toilets when you're in there but to get in there in the first place you kind of have to go through a very extensive search right you know what i mean you go in there you obviously show your your test you sorry your pcr your electoral flow test not pcr your electoral flow test or pcr regardless of which one you have just to get through one of the gates once you get through that gate you don't show your passport um the good thing is that they do accept you having a scan of your passport which is amazing because I forgot to bring mine like an idiot um, so I have to definitely get my provisional license in it sorted because I can't be carrying my passport around every day with me but it doesn't matter um, I forgot to bring that with me but that was fine because I had a scan once you take the scan you then take a picture on the machine when you take the picture on the picture machine for CCTV purposes you then go in um, to another bit where kind of from what I saw with the time I was in there it was like a whole group of ladies who were like stationed in like a kind of U shape and then you went to one you emptied your 
this into a bowl and then a guy came and scanned you with a metal detector and then the lady came and kind of extensively extensively searched you under the pits everything like proper you know patting it not patting you down like proper making sure you got nothing untoward in there so it made me think you know for because for the entirety for the entirety of the time i was in fabric many many people were coming up to me asking me if i was selling drugs all the time it happens all the time in clubs not that big of a deal i don't really give a shit but as i was thinking to myself like if i'm in there and people are asking me that kind of thing like how would the drug dealers actually get the stuff in here it's flipping impossible you know i mean they're legitimately searching every crevice of your bag every crevice of your body i don't know how these guys are getting drugs in there it's what it's one thing getting stuff in for yourself but to get stuff in to sell for people it just seems like a big big bother that doesn't really necessary um but that aside once you, yeah then then you get in you have to walk up the stairs do the whole ticket thing walk back down again it's a it's it's a lot do you know what i mean then once you're in there there's security everywhere on the dance floor there's people picking up glasses every time there's people walking in between the clouds with their flashlights on it just kind of takes you out of the vibe all the time jeremy it's a bit of a vibe killer i'm not going to lie um but obviously if you're off your face enough or if you're engrossed enough with the sounds of the beats that are rattling through that space you probably won't care too much but i guess because i was sober and i just came from home at like 1 a.m i woke up i thought oh shit i need to go to this thing I wasn't really, I mean, I wasn't in tune. I mean, I wasn't situated yet. But obviously after an hour or two, I kind of wasn't able to kind of zone things out and be able to dance, have a good time. But I don't know, it might not be the best place I'd go to for a sesh. But obviously to go see people play is sick. Sound system is amazing. I'd say Sound 2 sound system. No, I'd say the layout of Sound 2 I much prefer. That's why I think it worked really well for this um, Wigs event they had. Um, it kind of looks like a weird flipping altar at the at the top where the DJs are. There's like with lights that sort of makes the decks look like it's hovering and the lights at the top it just looks really amazing yeah it just looks amazing like a cathedral um and obviously room two is a little bit more square and it's a bit more rectangle really a shape so it kind of feels like one of those kind of you know bunker rave it's, it kind of feels like one of those underground underground clubs you would have gone to back in the day in east or someplace in peckham obviously it's a little bit bigger in that in terms of space wise but i quite like that and then of course the space in between um room two and room one there's loads of seating areas that you can go and jam in so if you want to just watch the djs play you can and obviously room one the sound system might be a little bit more punchy maybe but i quite like how it feels more dynamic in real two in room two if you get what i mean it just feels a bit more dynamic and the djs are right there you can see them everyone's kind of crowded around the friends and family on on either side of the booth sort of thing i love that kind of vibe and electricity that was going on in there and the front of the crowd that was dancing when everyone was playing was really going for it and you could tell most of them were friends family and stuff so that really added to it so yeah fabric was decent not going to lie um it's definitely not a write-off in my book um i was comparing it to places like egg but i think it's, it's a bit unfair <laughs> especially because you know of how long they've been doing it and the fact that they've got such a you know an amazing array of djs that they can buy at any given time i still think you know lineup wise they maybe have one of the better better lineups um in london in terms of week on week on week right that you can maybe just walk into without even bothering to check who's on the lineup you can definitely have a pretty decent time but you have to mentally prepare yourself when you do go in there in general but yeah big up wigs big up fabric and everyone that i bumped into over there on that night moving on we have some very sad news unfortunately courtesy of tmz it says here comedian fuquan johnson among three did after a suspected overdose fourth comic has been hospitalized so pretty bleak news happened over the weekend um the only reason why this was kind of crossed my um line was because it involved a lady called kate quigley who's the fourth victim who was a you know a long time guest on joey diaz podcast she's been on there many many times she's one of the better guests on there i really like her conversation the dynamic that she has with joey where he's basically her uncle or they kind of have a really kind of brotherly sister fatherly daughter kind of relationship um he's obviously trying to help her in her career in la being a stand-up and obviously being a woman and how difficult it is and the fact that she has to use her sexuality to get to certain places and he kind of argues that she shouldn't she should just focus on her talent so they have really good debates in general on the church of what's happening right now right over the years of her dating life and whatnot it's just been really interesting to just kind of see her evolution over the years and you just quietly root for people I don't know because it's a podcast you don't really know these people from afar but you listen to them enough you kind of root for them you want to see them do well so when I heard this story I was crushed first of all because I fam man because I did I did know that she mentioned that she was in a relationship with somebody who she really liked and I guess this Fuquan Johnson was the guy who she was seeing who kind of you know gave her um kind of it felt like he had uh reawoken her 
um you know her need for love right do you know what i mean it felt like she kind of lost hope in men in general um but i guess in la especially in la with how kind of maybe transactional things were but she bumped into one of the decent guys good guys it felt like by the looks of it and she was basically enjoying herself with him you know most of the time and it felt like you know that was maybe going to go somewhere serious you don't really know who knows how things work out but what a tragic turn of events man especially when you hear the cause of what exactly happened so it continues here the article let's read below it says Unless we the original said it says comedian um Fukuan Johnson died this weekend of an apparent overdose along with two others while the fourth person's hospital, the recent girlfriend of one Darius Rucker. Okay, the recent girlfriend of one Darius Okay, cool. Um law enforcement source oh, so she wasn't dating Fukuan, she's dating Darius. Okay, my bad. I, 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 I retract that one. They're gonna continue. Law enforcement sources tell TMZ there was a get together Friday night at someone's house in the Venice neighborhood of LA where Johnson was in attendance, as was Kate Quigley, a comedian who has been of late dating the Houty and the Burfish lead singer. This after the guy split with his longtime wife just last summer. Um Darius Rep, however, confirms to TMZ that he is not dating Kate and that he hasn't been for a while. They were reportedly going out for a good chunk of last year and there's loads of photos of them on the IG as a couple from last May there seems to be no affiliation, no affiliation now though so she was maybe going out of it maybe not but in general they're just hanging out I guess at the house having a good time and it all kind of went south very quickly as for who owns a place where it went down there's a few others listed a few owners listed and we do know quickly was a resident and perhaps still is as what appears to be an adjacent property right next door to where the 99 call was directed could be a duplex in any case we're told by the cops were summoned a little after midnight when they arrived they found four people who appeared to be either deceased or close to it jesus christ imagine being a police officer and walking into that scene our sources say that johnson and two others were pronounced dead on the scene while quickly was transported to put in a critical condition unclear how she's doing and um, we've cried, tried reaching out to a team for comment but come short of contact with a woman we are told cocaine laced with fentanyl appears to be what was ingested by all autopsies will be done for the three bodies which are the early coroners now we're working on getting the id the other two victims who might also be comedians themselves yeah and uh, supposedly they are well-known comedians too of varying levels of success so RIP to them as well but I can't imagine how heartbreaking this must be for Kate Quigley um, that is real survivor's remorse in it being in a room of four people you're all doing bumps and stuff and lines having a great time after a show or something or just catching up and then that leads to you know three out of the four people passing right in front of your eyes and it must be like i don't know how you recover for something like that do you know what I mean mentally like just god almighty like really really god almighty um it continues our law enforcement sources tell us that this um the lapd the lapd homicide unit was notified about the case but no word on whether we're getting directly involved just yet although lapd is investigating it's unclear who originally supplied the coke who brought it or what and other circumstances they might have been passed around and used by the four individuals because of that we're told that it's hard to tell if any changes might come of this as our sources say they don't know for now where the drugs came from still it could spell trouble um the possible mean uncle sam gets involved la macmillan whose death spurred a federal charges after the investigation with indictments of alleged dealers yeah true so they're gonna have to be very careful or the people or well, guess quite quickly for one has to be careful about who she speaks to now going forward because if they do bring federal charges forward and and they find out that she was the one that supplied it or somebody else that you know yeah i mean it, it can get really dicey really really quickly so hopefully she's got good support and people around her telling her to kind of you know keep stumped for now as she kind of recovers fukuan and kate are buddies they've been photographed together dating back a few years fjs and knees deep um in the comedy scene as is kate they kick it with the likes of joey da, 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 da. they need to mention all those names at the bottom there just getting them involved in nothing when they're not even there and then the update is this one we have here an update TMZ has learned the names of the two other people who died from the OD alongside Fuquan and one is indeed another comic law enforcement tell us that the two other deceased victims are Enrico Con Colling Colangini, Colangili, sorry, um, Rico and Jelly, also known as and Natalie Williamson, who were 48 and 33 years old, respectively. RIP, man. Thoughts and feelings go out to their families. Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, it looks like Kate Quigley is going to pull through. There's a text message here showed between her and Red Band. He texts her, text me if you're okay. And she says, I'm alive, I'm not great, but I'm okay. Comedian Brian Redman posted the update on Kate's health and she appears to respond to him saying she's alive, although not doing great still. So good news. And um, yeah, man, that's all you can just say. Good thoughts and feelings go out to Kate Quigley and everybody associated with this. Um, what a sad, sad turn of events. Um, the fentanyl laced drugs thing is just getting out of hand. 
it needs to come to some sort of stop or someone needs to in intervene because this is getting crazy man so many people are passing away so quickly off the back of this it's just absolutely insane but again thoughts and feelings got to kate you know i'm not here to kind of tell people how to live their lives and stuff because god knows we all get up to nonsense on the weekends and whatnot it's just one of those unfortunate state of affairs in it sometimes shit is just cut with dirty stuff or sometimes you just happen to bump into really unsanctimonious dealers in it who just yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't get it, man. But again, just heartbreaking stuff, man. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking stuff for everyone involved. And if that wasn't enough for the heartbreak, if that wasn't enough for the heartbreak, we've got even more sad and distressing news here that Michael K. Williams, um, legendary actor from The Wire, um, legendary actor from Bulldog Empire, legendary dancer, legendary all-round great dude from the sounds of it and pe what people say about him, is dead man what a hot this this one crossover just the timeline just you know a couple of hours ago and i just i can't i can't believe it man i really really can't believe it it says here the white actor um michael k williams found dead in an nlc apartment the white actor michael k williams was found dead on a suspected heroin overdose in his brooklyn's penthouse monday afternoon law enforcement told the post williams 54 was discovered unconscious in the dining room of his luxury williamsburg pad with what appeared to be heroin on the kitchen table and I don't know, man, like, I think I was speaking to somebody about this the other day, maybe on Discord or something about how, you know, heroin has unfortunately taken the lives of some of the greatest artists that I've ever known of them over my life. Um, one of the notable ones being Dash Snow, um, seminal New York artist who died way, way too young. Um, obviously, he had these other problems that he was dealing with, but in general, you know, heroin took him. He couldn't take he put it, couldn't take it down after many, many interventions. And this was before ever fentanyl came around, right? I think he might have died in the late uh, early two thousands or something, right? It's a long, long time ago. But yeah, man, to see somebody like a Michael K. Williams who was, you know, loved by all for the most part, to die in such a way is just such a shame. It really, really is a shame, especially at that age, man. It's no, it's no, it's no age to die for a, a successful black man like that living at the peak of his powers. You know what I mean, with just he's so much more to give. It's just, oh God. Um, obviously, the scenes of police and uh, you know medical services outside of his a penthouse apartment. God damn it! It says the acclaimed actor's nephew found him a little before two p.m. and someone called cops up to the address at forty-four Kent Avenue, saying there was a man there who was unresponsive and feels cold. Jesus Christ! Williams was pronounced dead by authorities at two twelve, so just ten minutes after, basically, he was already pronounced dead. So he must have been dead for a while. Sources said that adding that he appeared on TV shows, that the TV star had fatally OD'd. No foul play indicated. The police officer said no full century. The apartment was in order. A man sat sobbing alone at the table outside Williams building talking to his cell phone monday afternoon all these families outside here just oh god almighty man the heartbreak of that um i found a body and he could saw one man said into his phone who's as well new york post man have some decorum too bro what are they doing eavesdropping on man talking to his family and stuff like grieving over the phone and they were like fuck them let's skip all that shit um yeah oh that's him obviously in Bordeaux Empire playing Chalky White. You got here obviously in Omar, the seminal role in The Wire. Oh, Spores Before Dying. <sighs> I don't know what to say, man. It's heartbroken to be fair. One of my favorite actors and just personalities all around, especially the fact that he came into the game being a backup dancer and then being a choreographer. And I think got his first movie role off the back of Tupac liking the way he looked because of his scar, right? And I don't really know the history about the scar, but let's just imagine the scar didn't come from a good circumstance. And let's also imagine most likely than not when he was growing up, you know, he was bullied quite a lot for his scar. Um, and then to get to a point where one of the most important hip hop artists of your time is basically saying your car, your scar is the reason why I wanted to pick you for this role because I, I know you've probably lived the life that I've probably lived. We come from the same place and acknowledging the pain that you've suffered and using that as a way to kind of achieve your dream it must have been so gratifying, it must have been so oddly gratifying to have that moment. And the fact that he spoke directly to him was like, oh. And then, of course, the Janet Jackson, the backup dancing stuff, like, you know, all this amazing stuff and then becoming a legit actor later on in life. You know, the Omar role, in my opinion, I still think the chalky white role in Bulldog Empire was maybe his best in terms of displaying his range as an actor. The fact that he had to basically play this conflicted man who was trying to 
you know make money the legit quote-unquote white way but also trying to appease his community or his you know the people that he grew up with in the quote-unquote hood um the fact that he was that you know him trying to raise a young family daughters young kids um also with the wife that strain that you know living that kind of lifestyle puts on the relationship um you know the fact that you know dealing a life of crime you're always due to get backstabbed and people trying to take over for me i think remember there was a guy underneath him who thought he was going to take over his spot just so many different bits of border empire um him acting as chalky when border empire that i thought really stood out that for me really represented his range you could definitely tell this guy was an actor actor in that respect um because again he had to play somebody a little bit more restrained a little bit more sophisticated a little bit more layered than an omar maybe omar was layered don't get me wrong but it does a little bit more to him in terms of depth in terms of things he had to explore um was incredible 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 and i think i've said it before on twitter that i always thought that he'd be a great you know frankie knuckles in a biopic if that ever was to happen um especially leading to some of the you know some of the sadder parts of frankie knuckles story towards the end when he was struggling to you know make ends meet and all of his deals were fucked up and he couldn't get all the money that he basically rightfully earned over the years for some of the seminal tracks he made. I thought Michael K. Williams could definitely depict that maybe era of his life really well. Or maybe sometimes some of the good parts. Regardless, there were so many avenues you could go down. Um, just the other week or just, you know, recently when DMX passed, he was he played kind of one a, a starring role in some of the tributes that were led for him. So just now to hear only a few months later, he then and happens up passing as well due to some foul play with drugs. It's just, oh, it's heartbreaking, man. And like I mentioned before, somebody, it's just heartbreaking too, knowing somebody as famous and as well loved and as well regarded as him eventually has to end up passing away alone like this in the home. Do you know what I mean? Like in that kind of circumstance, it's just, that's the only sad part. That's one of the other sad parts about it. I'd hope when he was around, people let him know how special and how influential he was i hope that's the case i'm not really too sure if people did remind him and gave him his flowers while she was around but i hope they did um because yeah just dying alone like that yourself in your apartment it just crushes you man it's just when you think about stuff like that you think of somebody you know the art that they offer you all the good times all the memories all the boredoms that they help to eviscerate and then here they are dying alone with no one around them no friends no family just them alone with their thoughts, with their feelings. Some people are suggesting the pandemic might have played a role in it. I don't know. I'm not here to hypothesize. I'm just here to kind of, you know, remember a great guy, man. A great guy, a great actor, a great artist, somebody who had a lot more to give. 54 is no age to die. Um, people should be able to take drugs and have fun and live their lives if they're not have risk of dying, especially not... not <laughs> especially not somebody with his level of experience of being in a game he shouldn't be in a position where he should be passing away from doing some drugs that shouldn't be the case but unfortunately drugs nowadays especially in the u.s are being laced with fentanyl even to the extent of like xanax and weed is so if you're out, out there just be careful man just be careful that's it really be careful i'm not here to tell you to stop and don't do this don't do that because people are going to do what they're going to do everyone's an adult um you're free to do what you want with your time and your money but just be careful in it just be careful because the last thing we want is people more people to be passing away off the back of this man but yeah r.i.p michael k williams um gone but never forgotten at least when you're an artist of his caliber you'd leave behind some seminal um timeless work that can be revisited again and again and again people on the timeline are heavily sharing clips of him talking in interviews clips of him playing different characters on tv and movies and stuff and it's just endless the amounts of content he's able to produce again elite level artist elite level person who's been able to create so many seminal moments that people have captured and recorded and saved in their memory banks and again his memory will live on forever and that's one of the great things about being an artist you rarely if ever die at the moment that you passed away any moment your name is brought up again you're alive again Jeremy, you spring back to life again um you're kind of uh ever young in it but yeah r.i.p and michael k williams man. sucks in it that sucks real real bad um i guess moving on from that moving on from that sad news um we do move on to some of the better news over the weekend was that Drake's sixth studio album, Certified Lover Boy, finally did drop. It finally ended up coming out, and the debates around it have been striking. Striking debates about it. Um, of course, I was more intrigued at the idea that people were comparing Certified Lover Boy to Donda, or that people were very harsh 
about Donda in the beginning, but then were also very harsh and flipping about Certified Love. But it just made me think about the hypocrisy in fan bases. It made me think about people's tendencies to want to just jump out the window and be the first person to call something trash and stuff. And it just kind of run, drummed home the idea that most people aren't really objective when it comes to art or stuff that they consume. Because I think for the most part, we haven't really, oh no, maybe we're objective. And we also don't really have the, it feels like most people don't have the, the ability to dissect or to describe why they like something because people spend so much time shitting on stuff online that's my fear I have a theory people don't really have a, a way of displaying how they like something so they even say something it's so binary it's very trash or this is the greatest of all time go or trash go or trash I mean that's uh, that's what it kind of feels like fire emoji or trash bat or trash or trash bin emoji there's no real in between and I feel like music albums in general have always been like that there's rarely you know that's why the great albums are the great albums because there's rarely a lot of those great albums where they're just solid from the front to the back they're usually elements that you like some bass that you don't like maybe this artist going direction in sound that you're just not really vibing with maybe they've done something in the public life that just doesn't really vibe with you either there's things that happen that would make you that kind of affect your listening experience when it comes to an album when it finally does come out and i think drake is basically suffering from that right he's had 10 years of unparalleled success where he's the kind of main guy that everyone's kind of aiming and sniping for he's the guy that everyone's waiting to drop he's the guy that everyone waits to drop um he's the one that all the fans want to see live shows are packed he sells out these places venues arenas blah 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 he is the hot ticket item he is the number one supreme you know hip-hop artist at the moment right so it's it's it's, it's fairly it's to be expected people would be looking at his album thinking okay this is where you have to show and prove us you are who you are people are saying that he has to have a he has, doesn't have a what do you call it um doesn't have a classic album so he has to really come with one blah 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 so there's a lot of pressure put on the back of this album when it did eventually drop but one thing that i did quickly notice was that the same people that were saying donda was shit were then immediately saying surf i love boy is really good and i just couldn't get it in my head because from what i listened to what i heard was one artist in kanye who's consistently pushing the envelope, trying to at least make each of his albums sound completely different because he's going for completely different sounds. He's trying to do something completely different to what Drake is trying to do, right? It's not better, it's not worse, but they're trying to do different things. But as an artist, in terms of listening to an album and saying whether or not this is good or bad, it's very difficult to say Donda shit and in Certified Love Boy is awesome. Because if anything... The Kanye West album is a better representation of one album maybe should sound like, if that makes sense, in terms of it being more of an exploration in sound, maybe marking a time in history. You know, the fact that Kanye is now basically a born again Christian, he's gone through what he's gone through with the politics and whatnot. This album is a good encapsulation of his many breakdowns and breakthroughs that you're basically going to get, right? Just Donna represents everything that we've known about Kanye from maybe what was the last album? Was it Yay or whatever it was? Until now, this has been a good summation of what's happened in those, what, last 18, two years or whatever that's happened in between. Um, so if I love a boy, if anything is an extension of what Drake always does, it may not be a good summation of what he's getting up to in the last year or so, maybe with the exception of a few tracks in the album where he gets a look very, very personal and in-depth. But overall, in terms of how it sounds, it probably sounds like more of what you expect the Drake album to sound like than anything else so it's hard to say that is much better than donda again i think people should just enjoy both albums this comparing of artists and whatnot is lame but it's just difficult to listen to somebody who says donda is um shit but surf boy is the best thing since last spread it's just very difficult it's somewhere in between but that being as that aside i still maintain what i've said previously even though i'm not the fan of the entire project overall there's a lot of skips in this for me i still think overall it's probably drake's best cohesive album project if that makes sense it's probably drake's best album even though for me i think there's a lot of skips why do i say that because i feel like in terms of sounds in terms of textures, in terms of sonics, whatever you want to describe it as, it's probably the most cohesive I've heard him sound, knitted together. The sequencing is perfect. The track selection, the production is just out of this world. It sounds expensive. It sounds lush. It sounds layered. It sounds very OVO, right? It's probably the best probably representation of what OVO sound is actually really about. It sounds like one, I think when I first heard it, it's, to me it sounded like one long OVO mix, which was maybe what they were trying to go for. But there was real no standout kind of like get out of your seat moments, which you usually do get with a Drake. Think of his previous albums, some of the standout tracks. Maybe he's just not in that space anymore. Or maybe it's hard to make that track when you're in COVID. I think I remember hearing an interview with Skepto he says something along the lines of like oh when everyone's thinking that he wrote something about he retired he think he was just saying no I'm just not going to be writing anything now 
I think he said everything that's coming out will be stuff that I made in 2019, but I'm not going to be creating anything now because the vibes are just off, isn't it? The vibes are off. It's hard to make bangers um, when you're all stuck at home and nothing to do and the world's, you know, in disarray. So when the world reopens up again, maybe he can get back to the studio and be able to kind of make those jump out your seat bangers. So maybe this is why there is no real kind of edge of your seat moment on this album with Drake. It's all kind of really kind of, you know, it kind of, you, you, you pop in your head, you can play in a car as you're whipping around or you're on a run or you're doing your little, you know you're doing your your um your life admin stuff on a weekend it's a great accompaniment that way because you don't really need to change and run to a track to skip it but for me i did find there's a lot of fillers in it overall together but again my own personal opinion um so let's scroll down to track this and point out some of my favorite tracks that i really enjoyed um of course um in the bible i thought was absolutely stupendous i thought little dirk's verse was 16 bars way too short i thought Givian was amazing towards the end of it i thought drake's opening bar like the slur on it I'm not sure if that was on purpose it kind of sounded like he was leaned out and stuff like was just incredible the fact that he came in like on a half a beat right okay 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 oh it was just like yeah amazing 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 obviously little Dirk shouting out his girl and that was sick I thought love all was really awesome um, Jay-Z pondering and contemplating why people are surprised that he's not friends with somebody that tried to kill him it's really funny when you think about the fact that he's like bemused he's bewildered why people think it's weird for him not to be friends with that guy I thought that track was absolutely sick um, way too sexy of course um, sampling Red Rod the, the legendary Rod Stewart song was amazing to hear that Rod Stewart song I played in sets in bars and stuff where I've been DJing and it's always gone off right it's always going off um, what else I love um, the end too deep song oddly enough Enough. I think I've sold somebody else. This might be actually the best f future track on here, or the best future, uh, the best future feature, or the best feature, the best track featuring future on the track. Um, people would say it was too sexy, but I think this Into Deep might be one of the best standout moments. I think for that one, um, I'm going to say another one that was one of my favorites. Uh, Fountains by featuring Temp was really good. Get along better is good too. The track with um, Rick Ross and Lil Wayne, not really a fan at all. I think for Lil Wayne and Rick Ross collaborations, it was very lackluster. For Rick Ross collaborations specifically, it was fairly lackluster. Um, they've done far better collabs in the past, but a real big standout. Is it Jerome Braithwaite? Isn't that party next door, right? It is. Um, a, a real standout for me was Fucking Fans, one of the last tracks towards the end. Obviously, Remorse is really cool, but Fucking Fans, I thought, was that was peak drake that was incredible to hear to me i mean really really incredible to hear um i guess maybe the one that's the things i was thinking about it like think of a loosely or think of like a throwaway track like wu-tang forever was there a moment as strong as wu-tang forever on this album there really wasn't in it i don't know what it is i don't know if it's because it's just hard to create something at this in this era of that sort of likeness right now or maybe he's just not there where he is where he was at when he made Wu-Tang Forever I'm not too sure but that didn't even exist on here so if anything there's about five tracks on here that I love the rest you know I could you know I could maybe you know I'm not that bothered about don't get me wrong but they're not like you know trash worthy um you know album cuts i don't think so in my personal opinion obviously the opening track champagne poetry is banging i think if anything champagne poetry was a big honey um honey dick right because that made you think you were going to get one album and then when it started playing it was like you know it kind of meandered out but i thought champagne poetry was an incredibly good um album intro um but again this does, stuff doesn't matter because in the, the day the numbers speak for themselves in it the numbers absolutely speak for themselves. They're expecting, they're expecting this guy, right? OVO, Drake, <laughs> to sell supposedly anywhere between 575,000 and 625K first week. Usually these are like pop star numbers, right? These are like what, you know, the Adele's and the, you know, what you call it, Taylor Swift's and stuff get, which makes sense, right? Because they're, you know, Caucasian ladies that, that sing pink, sorry, that sing, um, that sing, that sing uh, pop music. So for sure, most people are going to be into that kind of thing. So it makes complete sense why those boy, those kind of vibes would be a lot more felt than others. But for Drake to make the music that he makes, talking about the nonsense that he's talking about, right? And the album he's talking about him, you know, telling girls that he's a lesbian too when they when they say they're lesbians, like really cringy bars for somebody who's like, you know, in their thirties with a kid. You know, it's not really cute anymore. I get it, but the fact that people still love this guy to that extent that they'd buy six hundred and twenty-five thousand copies of this record first week is just wild. 
absolutely insane. I'm sure all the, the hype and the beef and stuff with Kanye maybe added to it. But still, man, this guy's star power is just on another level. It really is. So it doesn't actually matter what you think of the album because sooner rather than later, if it's good music, you're going to like it towards the end because it's just going to keep banging it in your ear until you love it. And I think in general, having now listened to it over a few days, it's still not as bad as I think people are making it seem as us. I think people thought they were going to get one thing and it wasn't that, but I don't think it's as bad as they're making it seem as. It's still a pretty solid project, maybe one of the better projects that came out this year. Maybe compared to, again, Kanye's artistry, it maybe it's not up there in terms of artistry, but I just don't think they're the same artist. I think in an ideal world, they'd be friends and they'd make amazing music together because where Kanye is maybe an expert, he, an expert in terms of art and in terms of exploring new sounds in the way they deliver, in terms of how they execute things. Maybe Drake is an expert and a wordsmith and a flipping savant when it comes to putting words together, when it comes to creating hooks, when it comes to creating moments on a track. Like he knows what he's doing. So imagine those two guys together in the studio going off each other, trying to outdo one another as well, maybe slightly. Imagine how amazing that album or that mixtape would be. It would be sensational, but we're never going to get that, unfortunately, because they absolutely hate each other's guts, which is, again, understandable. But um, yeah, I thought the Drake album was decent. Um, Certified Lover Boy, again, I still think it's one of his better albums, but for me, it still isn't my favorite it still isn't that great i think overall i think there's not a lot of standout tracks there's maybe five and five out of what 21 is just not enough um in my opinion for a drake album to be good but still the fact that he was able to put out such work back to back um the fact that most of his albums for the most part are pretty solid and this is maybe one of the most ones you know people are a little bit off kilter with says a lot about his level of penmanship so you know it doesn't really matter who really cares i just wish people will just enjoy everyone's music um you know independently of having to cuss the other one that's what i'd hope but again one can only hope um what else do we have here what else do we have here Du, 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 du. Did I got the thing here? I don't really have it, do I? No. Okay. We'll feature another one. Where is it? Oh, man. Did I get it? Yeah, there we go. Cool. Let's move here. So, in a company news, we've got here Andre 3000 releases a statement on Kanye's leaked Drake this Life of the Party. So if this wasn't enough, off the back of this album coming out and maybe receiving mixed reviews, it looked like Kanye or no, it looked like Drake wanted to maybe throw the cats amongst the pigeons and introduce another element into this beef. Maybe because some people are hypothesizing that Drake has a very um, cutthroat, personal, rude, maybe overstepping a mark diss track coming for Kanye. And he didn't want anyone to start saying he's a bully or that he's going over the top. So he wanted to make sure people knew what he was reacting to because the, the, the understanding was that there was going to be a track on the Donda album that was going to speak directly to Drake, right? That was going to be a little bit more, you know, personal and angry and maybe detail some of the reason why he's got such a big uh, problem with him and blah de blah 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 That never ended up coming out, right? Maybe because, you know, somebody's got into Kanye's ear, maybe because they changed their mind, I don't know, but something definitely has changed there because we also heard a snippet of an intro that was meant to go on the beginning of some sort of Drake track that never ended up coming out either where Drake, Kanye is basically talking about how, you know, Drake is very popular and he fucks all kim's friends and shit right so this stuff has happened and been omitted last minute that i think has been moved around right so um kanye i guess is, is gonna bring out something or maybe drake is responding but regardless of the thing drake got his overview radio and basically released this track called life of the party which i think again might be one of the best tracks if it ever did come out on donda it features andre 3000 it's meant to be a tribute obviously um to donda and um, kanye's mum um andre for her to get on it too and basically raps an incredible verse about um, his relationship with his mother and how his her passing affected the family and it's just a very personal and amazing floating of a it's just an amazing verse from somebody who again who we don't necessarily have the ability to get more music out of because they've decided to move on to other things and it's incredibly frustrating that usually the greats the people that you know are just otherworldly with this shit right who just are gifted and born with the ability to rhyme and to create these flipping you know visuals in your mind with their words are the ones that are also the most conflicted about whether or not they should go ahead and do it as a job in it as a career it's just it's a so infuriating he's just so fucking good on Trey 3000 legitimately like he might be in my top five of, of rappers and mcs it's just an insane how good that verse is just our other world i've replayed it so many times but anyway this article from tmz sorry from pitchfork says the following andre 3000 andre 3000 has released a statement 
about his participation in Life of the Party, an unreleased Kanye West track and supposed done the outtake that Drake shared during a uh, September 3rd Sirius XFM broadcast. In the statement, the rapper claims that his contribution didn't make the album due to West's current stance against profanity. It says the following, A few weeks ago, Kanye reached out about being part of the Dunder album. I was inspired by his idea to make a musical tribute to his mum. It felt appropriate to me to support the Dunder content by referencing my own mother who passed away in 2013. We both shared a loss and I thought this was a beautiful choice um, to make a clean album about. Unfortunately, I didn't know that that was a plan before I wrote and recorded my verse. It was clear to me that the uh, edited clean format of the verse would not work without having the raw unoriginal also available so sadly i had to be omitted from the original album release which is fair um fair but you know i think you could make some omissions with andre get him to rewrite that verse man it's too good i write i, I track um sorry i uh, the track i received and wrote to didn't have the disc verse on it oh let's pause this with um what's his face because these autoplay videos are always annoying um it says yeah so the track i received and wrote to didn't have the desk verse on it and we were hoping to make a more focused offering of the donda album but i guess things happen like they are supposed to it's unfortunate that it was released in the way and two artists that i love are going back and forth i wanted to be on certified lover boy too i just want to work with people that inspire me hopefully i can work with kendrick on his album i love to work with little baby <laughs> you know respect them all man he's just the most respectful guy in the world isn't it? don't can't don't you love andre if you just letting it be known that look i'm not picking sides in this shit i don't want to get involved i love everybody you'll make amazing music music and we'll just kiss and make up and play the flute he's just a top dude in it unfortunately that isn't going to happen because kanye's bars on that track are just yeah 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 we just have to kind of you know say that that's kind of that thing is over in it um so i think what is it um yeah one of the things that you see that's really interesting about this kanye and drake beef right is that Drake seems to be the only person to really get under Kanye's skin. I've never seen anybody press Kanye's buttons as much as Drake without even saying too much. I'm sure stuff happens behind the scenes that we're not aware of. I'm really sure that happens. But from what we see in front of camera or on records and stuff, Drake really touches these buttons by just being, just existing, right? Just doing his thing, moving around the town and, you know, being the hip-hop jock that Kanye says he is, seems to really get under his skin to the point where he just can't, you know, he just can't get this guy out of his head and it's really hilarious. So one of the things that kind of um, stood out to me was obviously this line here. Uh, the things, it's really interesting to see the things that annoy Kanye. I think that should be a, a blog or an Instagram. Things that annoy Kanye because he's got some very specific things that piss him off in it. Like the, no fade outs right on the end of songs right that's why we songs just end the way they end there's no fading out shit there's little things that pee him off so look at look at the thing that pees him off sci high um again a very prominent writer somebody who's been a ghostwriter they say for a lot of our favorite rappers out there and somebody who's pain game a lot of people respect it says here on the lyric sci high told me to his face that sicker mode obviously the seminal track with uh travis and drake sci high told me that sicker mode was his biggest song um well go on well go and cause the what sorry well, go on, cause Dunder was the best ghostwriter I ever had, right? So I said, D um, so so I told him to face him was his biggest song, which obviously was an offense to Kanye, because he felt like you know I'm your biggest song, I'm your biggest artist, me Kanye West. How can you tell me Drake's your biggest artist when I don't I don't fuck with this guy? So that's one thing that obviously got in his neck. Then he obviously he talks into this this interesting part of the beef that has to do with. Drake and Virgil Abloh, which a lot of people are hypothesizing about online. I don't even know what the truth is. It still feels like to me, as I mentioned on um, Who is Celebrity Who is Celebrity Vice, I think the other day I mentioned it. It's, it still feels like to me that Kanye and Virgil Abloh's relationship, Virgil Abloh obviously being the founder of Off-White and now the artistic, di what, the artistic um, director of men's of Louis Vuitton or whatever, right? Um, it feels like to me that their relationship has never really recovered ever since Virgil got the job at Louis Vuitton. Obviously, that seminal moment of Virgil doing his show at LV, the first one, and you know um, him crying on the runway together with Kanye hugging on there was really powerful. You know, you knew what that moment meant to both these guys, and you know what they've been through. You obviously knew the whispers behind the scene that Kanye obviously wasn't happy about Virgil being offered the job, the fact that he wanted that job for so long in his career, or just any kind of fashion job in that respect, and obviously being you know known as a Louis Vuitton don, and for Virgil to end up going getting it was something that was a bit of pill to swallow a little bit of jealousy a little bit of envy you know it just it just get weird i understand why that could get weird it's like you you and your friend go to go trials for a football team he didn't want to go and he ends up getting in and you don't it's gonna be it's gonna hit you hard a little bit but it felt like to me even though they kind of 
publicly sort of recover their relationship after that. It didn't ever feel like it was ever going to go back because, you know, Virgil's his own guy now. He's a made guy. He's got this great career. He's branching out into many different things. He's got many different projects. Um, he's held a high regard at both companies that didn't that kind of overlooked Kanye in terms of Louis Vuitton and Nike. Um, so it just would make for an awkward friendship at this point in their lives it's just what it is isn't it unfortunately um i guess especially in the creative space it's just one of those things so with that it did seem strange at the time when virgil then started to kind of buddy buddy up with drake now in one sense you could say it's drake cool you understand it um you know just is what it is but on the other side if you're kanye's friend and you know that he definitely hates this guy it's difficult to then justify as Kanye says in this lyric, I put Virgil and Drake on the same text and it wasn't about the, mar the matching Arterix or Kid Cudi dress. I just told these grown men, stop it with the funny shit. I might hire the whole a team from ACG, right? So clearly Kanye had a problem with seeing um, Virgil and uh, Drake gallivanting around in their light wash jeans and the matching Arterix jackets that they wore as they were parading around town, right? That kind of, inf that kind of a, uh, um, momentous time when they were just got I forgot what show they were going to. It was Paris. I don't know what it was. Um, so quite clearly, he has an issue with that, and the fact that now you know Virgil or you know or yeah, Virgil basically has kind of segued his way into you know working with um, Kid Cudi on a capsule collection. I think that was maybe being presented with Off White. You know, that was led to the dress, obviously, that he wore on Saturday Night Live. I get it. I completely do get it, but I just don't know where that puts Virgil in this position. Like, what's he meant to do? Is he not meant to talk to Drake because Kanye hates him? Don't any of you guys have friends that you know or friends of friends that don't like each other? You don't pick sides. You just have to, you know, hope they get over it. Do you know what I mean? But it's hard to, unless you're your best friends, but you don't just go and pick sides and say, I'm not going to fuck with you because he doesn't fuck with you. Sometimes your friends are just fall out in the midst of you all being friends. Then what? Do you know what I mean? Because they were cool before Kanye and Drake and then they obviously fell out. So, you know, if Kanye, sorry, if Virgil then do a friendship with Drake away from Kanye what's he meant to do not talk to the guy anymore and if and unfortunately Drake's famous isn't he? he's one of the biggest stars in the world if not one of the biggest stars in the world the biggest so every time they do go out and kind of hang out even if they aren't wearing matching Arterix jackets they're still going to get papped they're still going to get snapped it might look away but you know it's just the nature of the game right? like but it's just again funny the stuff that you hear from Kanye that absolutely annoys him and of course there's another line here going at drake where he says um thought he was thought he was in abu dhabi told drake don't play with me on gd it's like it's kanye now a member of the gangster's disciples or is this just him trying to act hard and he sent that message to everybody so i guess drake basically forwarded on that message <laughs> what are you trying to claim that drake is a snitch drake is six nine so i said so if i hit you with a wyd you better hit me with yes sir i'm writing everything you need which might be entirely in into the original part of the beef where allegedly Drake went and writ some bars for, I don't know what album that was, maybe it was Ye or something. So that might be tying into it, but I don't really know. Either way, um, I think as fans, it's a good thing that these guys are beefing because it means we're going to get far better music from these two guys because they're in some sort of conflict. It's just it's the nature of the beast. You go through grief, you go through heartbreak, you're going to definitely bring out some of your best work. So it's no surprise that Certified Lover Boy and Donda was so strong. Despite their flaws, there were very strong projects to come out, especially Kanye. The improvement from... Um, um, the yay project is it the last one the yay project whatever it came before that to donda is just stark like night and day from the way he rolled it out to the merch to the lyrics to the features to the mixing it's just another level right it's just you can tell he's in his bag and i think there's a f interview recently featured um on some german channel where he speaks as this kid and basically basically something on lines of like oh um yeah, let me try and find it, actually. I'm here to create music. This is what my divine calling is. I'm here to do music. Music is my thing. Um, and you can definitely tell he's definitely in his pocket for music. He's definitely decided, okay, cool. Let's double down on the music thing. The fashion thing is doing its thing. I can go back on there later. But for now, I need to hone in on the music and get back to where it's going. And I'm I'm a fan. I'm not going to lie, man. I didn't think he was able to do it. I didn't think he was able to recover and get that bug again in terms of music. But bloody hell, he can. Uh, let me see if I can find it. It's a little interview that he does with like a German TV station. <clears throat> um, and he gave this guy a real big look actually in terms of doing it. Let's see. Uh, yes, 
yeah this is the one um unfortunate interview so yeah it says the interview here is available in english let's scroll down let's get up on the thing let's pause this because you, you know it's in german anyway so i think this part of the interview here if i scroll down here it says different architecture duh, duh, duh. choose berlin um where is it he says something around here he says yeah do you have a specific date for new music or is it just inspirational music he says the reason why god put me in here is to make music god put demna here to design god put me here to make music god put taido um ando here to create architecture you know god put james terrell here god put matthew barney here god put us all here for a reason and the reason is to be a conductor and to produce a lot of music so if so i mean i produce music in my mind no matter where so he's out here to produce tunes it's what he's doing and i think this is why we're getting the best version of kanye because he's focused on just making music and again he's got his adversary in his head he's this he's got this mask on he's this super villain he's got this different kind of persona that he's rocking when he's on stage there's no surprise that the music sounds so good man really is no surprise but yeah um certified lover boy you know is what it is that leaked track from drake was or the leaked track from kanye was sensational i can't wait to hear what the drake's reply is to that that's going to be pretty decent too going forward and all in all man for the fans we're the ones eating in it we are the ones eating um and i think that might be it yeah 128 oh jesus christ a long time bro long long time me rabbiting on here 128 the excellent show effective for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company it's been great it's been fun it's been exhilarating if it's the first time checking the show via youtube you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and if you're watching or listening via the podcast app please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends and until then my friends i'll be back soon take care be safe all that enjoy Peace.